Hey guys, welcome back. Today's video is going to be a slightly painful one. Now, I've been making knives for a while now and have thrown away many of them due to mistakes. A lot of times you can make a mistake early or midway through the process where you don't have a ton of time invested in your knife. In this case, I didn't realize that I had a crucial flaw in this knife until towards the end of the project. So stick along and hopefully y'all can uh, prevent yourselves from making the same mistake by watching me make it. I'd also like to point out that this knife design came to me from Jason at Diomedes Industries. He is a professional leather sheath maker. He makes amazing work and we were going to do this knife as a collaboration but since I messed it up this knife will not be being sold in a collaboration. However, in the future that is something we plan on doing. So if you're looking for a custom sheath for your knife, go check out Jason's page and I will link it down below. Yeah guys, so this is the nicest knife that I've ever made that I won't be selling. So uh, this is kind of where I started off with my problems. I originally measured out a nice uh, distance for that lanyard hole and then I tightened up that measurement closer to the end of the knife and that will come back to haunt me later on in this build. But as y'all have seen so far, I've cut out the design, I have drilled in a 3 16 of an inch hole for my sharpening choil, and then I have filed in my jimping on the spine. I'll be using two Corby fasteners and one eighth inch decorative center pin. That's gonna be a mosaic. So on each of these Corby fasteners, I'll be drilling a number 13 hole. I'll drill an eighth of an inch hole in the middle, and then my lanyard tube is going to be a quarter of an inch. I am also drilling some weight reduction holes uh, with a quarter inch drill bit and then I think I use an old number 13 bit uh, just to get in these tighter spaces uh, in, in between the actual holes for the pins. After I have all the holes drilled I will countersink them and then get ready to heat treat this blade. This is actually the next morning I decided to get an early morning heat treat on this blade so that I can be tempering it uh, during breakfast and things of that nature and have some time in the afternoon to work on it. So we're gonna get into forge. I do two normalizing cycles on this blade. I don't think with the steels that I am buying, you know, they come pre-normalized and yield, so I don't think this is necessary, but I always like to normalize a few times uh, just to make sure I don't have any major issues. So I quench in parks 50 and then I put it in my straightening jig and clamp down on it so that it can cool straight. As a side note, this is a 1084 blade steel and it skates a file nice and good here. So we have this blade super hard. Moving on to the tempering, I will be clamping it in uh, a pair of angle iron pieces in order to hold this blade straight, or actually these two blades in this case, while I am tempering them. When you're tempering a blade, you have the small chance, I guess, of them shifting a little bit during the temper, and I just wanna prevent the possibilities of that from happening. So I did two tempering cycles at around 210 degrees Celsius. After tempering is complete, I'm going to be grinding in my bevels. I'm going to start off by scribing a center line. I like going with one center line nowadays. I know some people like using two. Whenever I use two parallel lines, I find that I end up with an edge thickness that is too thick. So I get one center line, and then I'm going to be using my 45 degree jig here to make sure that I nail that center line so my edge is right down the middle of the blade. This is kind of a slower process using this jig, but I really like it because this sets up success for the rest of your grind. If you get this wrong and then you continue on with your bevels, uh, you'll have pretty messed up bevels moving forward. But if you get this part right and have that edge right down the center, it makes the rest of the process easier. So I grind down to pretty close to that line and then I'm just cleaning up the spine with a 200 grit belt and I like cleaning up the choil area and all of the, uh, the spine areas of the knife to about a 220 or in this case a 320 grit finish before moving on. 
I'm then going to put it on my surface grinder and work the finish up from a 280 grit gator belt. And then I take a big step here straight to a 400 grit cork belt. And it actually worked out pretty good. You can see I was getting a little warm, so I sprayed down the blade with some water to make sure that it stayed cool. I loaded up this 400 grit cork belt with some green uh, buffing compound, and then we get after it. And it actually, uh, just in a two-step process of 280 to 400, uh, produced a very nice finish on this blade. More than uh, finished enough for a stone wash, which is what we'll be doing. I wanted to note that I didn't go straight to the surface grinding because by using that 45 degree jig, I would have messed up the surface finish. So I went to the 45 degree jig first, got down to my center line, and then moved on to the surface grinding attachment. Now that we have the flats of the blade finished, we will start working on our bevels. To do this, I start off with a 60 grit ceramic belt, and I work my bevels towards the spine. I do this by knocking down uh, the peaks and then slowly applying pressure towards the spine of the knife to work that entire bevel downwards. I get it pretty close with a 60 grit belt. Uh, I want to have around an eighth to a sixteenth of an inch of uh, spine left there or, or material left between the top of the bevel and the spine before I move on to the next belt. So I'll get both sides to a 60 and then I'll move to a 120 grit J-Flex belt after this. The J-Flex belt will allow me to hang the belt over the side of the platen and get a radius in my plunge lines. It is with the 120 grit belt that I really try to dial in the symmetry in my plunges. On the 60 grit, I still try to get them fairly close, but when I move to a 120 grit, that's when I try to get them uh, way closer that getting them close with the 60 grit gives you a little bit of uh, grace when you're moving on to this 120 grit belt. If they're way off with the 60 grit, it's gonna be harder getting them in line with the 120. After that, I moved on to a 220, and that's what you see here. What you just saw me do is, it could be superstitious, I don't know, but I ground one side of the blade and got that plunge line dialed in, and then I took the belt off, flipped it around, so that the same side of the belt is grinding the other plunge line. I don't know if that makes that big of a difference. I've heard people say that it does, so I gave it a shot here. And my results were fairly good. I did gum up the finish once or twice, and that's why I went back with the hand sanding real quick to make sure that my flats were nice and uh, ground to a 320 grit finish. So this is my DIY etch machine that I built off of Chris Crawford's plans. I have a full build video of this uh, etching machine, but you can also see written plans on his website. I have it in DC etching power, and I will be hitting it about 12 times on DC power for one second holds. You can see here that that gives me a fairly deep etch, but it's a little bit messy. To clean it up, I hit it with a little WD-40 and lightly give it one pass on the Scotch-Brite belt. If you have a brand new Scotch-Brite belt, it may take some of the darkness out of your etch and that may not be desirable, so be careful. This Scotch-Brite belt is very old, so that is not a problem. After that, I put it in the acid and I leave it in there for about two minutes, take it out, clean it off with steel wool, and then put it back in the acid for two more minutes, take it out, clean it off with steel wool, and I do that about five times. Once I have that process completed, I'll make sure to coat the entire blade with baking soda and then put it into my tumbling jig. People ask me a lot about what type of media I have in this jig, and it's really nothing fancy. These are just pebbles uh, that you would buy at a home and garden store. Uh, I stole them from some of my wife's decor. So you can use whatever rocks that you have on hand, uh, even some ceramic tumbling media that may work better. Uh, but the rocks seem to do a pretty good job here. So this is our final stone wash finish. We'll start working on the handles. These handles are going to have two liners. It's actually three layers, but one of those liners comes uh, as a two-tone liner. So it's gonna go black, white, black, and then we're going to be using some laminated wood. I got this laminated wood from MakerMaterialSupply.com and they call it Dymalux. 
The laminated wood comes in quarter inch pieces, but once everything is said and done, these are around 3 eighths of an inch. I clean up the flats roughly on the belt sander, and then I bring the liner material down to the wood. After we get the liners flush with the scales, we will head over to our granite surface plate here, or this is actually a sink cutout, and we will flatten the scales using a piece of sandpaper. In this case, this is a 120 grit piece of sandpaper. We'll then clamp the scales together with our knife as a drill template and start drilling our holes. Like I said earlier, we will be transferring through these number 13 holes for the Corby fasteners. Without using a backing board, I found that the number 13 holes had some blowout on the back end. And since we're going to be countersinking these holes with Corby fastener heads that are a quarter inch, those two holes aren't a big deal. However, the center hole and the lanyard hole would have been more of a big deal if they had blowout. So I used a backing board for both of those holes and it did not have an issue with a significant amount of blowout of the back of the scales. After we have our holes drilled, we will start cutting out roughly the shape of our handle. We'll get it cut out on the Bauer bandsaw here from Harvard Freight, and then move over to the 2x72 to clean us up to the line. I mentioned this in one of my previous videos, but I'm trying to get closer to this line when making knife handles because it provides less work to do after the glue up. So we get close all the way around, and then we grind in a 45 degree angle for the front of our handle scales. I start off with a 60 grit belt to get close to my final dimension and then move up to a 220 grit belt to knock off the bulk of those heavy scratches. Having liners and a knife make this process easy because in this case I am grinding up to the end of the white liner. Once I'm done with the grinder, I will move on to hand sanding the front of these handle scales to a 1000 grit finish. To do that, I chuck them up in my new pipe vise. I've really been loving this little vise, and you will see later when I am working on the handle the different angles that I am able to get with this vise versus my old knife vise. If you're interested in a pipe vise, I'll make sure to put the link to this one down below. It seems to be a fairly good value for the money. Next, we will be counterboring the holes for the heads of our Corby fasteners, and to do this, I'm using my mill and I moved the shoulder of the counterbore down to a sixteenth of an inch away from the top of the table. I then set a stop on my mill so that this is repeatable. I went and I counterbored all four of the holes for my Corby fasteners. I chose this sixteenth of an inch dimension because I want the Corby fasteners to sit very deep into this handle. I will be coke bottle shaping this handle and I didn't want to run into a scenario where I grind into the void of the Corby fastener, so I made sure to get those Corby fasteners nice and deep. We will be modifying these Corby fasteners so that they are less than a quarter of an inch from head to head. We'll now move on to the glue up. In this case, I am using some G-Flex epoxy, and I make sure to clean off all the parts before glue up with alcohol before starting. I start off by getting some glue into the holes where the Corby heads will sit, and then I coat the whole outside of the scale, get it all put together with some screwdrivers, and hammer in my pins gently. After you do a glue up, make sure you clean up the bits that you won't be able to get to later, like the front of the handle scales. Going with a very aggressive 60 grit belt, I flatten both sides of the knife and then bring the handle material down to the metal on the spine of the knife. When I start getting close, I transition to a 220 grit belt so that I don't put big scratches into the spine. The first step on my Coke bottle in here is to make a taper from the back of the knife towards the front of the handle scales so that the front of the handle scales are way thinner, about a quarter of an inch per side or about 624 thousandths, and the back of the knife is way thicker, about 880 thousandths. Once I have this nice taper, I move on to an 8-inch wheel to hollow out my palm swells. 
This is the first time I've used a large wheel for this operation and I actually recently got this 8 inch wheel in my shop. And I was very happy with how this turned out. Using a larger wheel uh, allows you to contact more of the radius and you don't have to move up and down as much as I did with a 2 inch wheel. I felt like I was able to get both sides of the curve more symmetrical faster. Once I have the curvature put into my palm swell, I start knocking off the edges with the 8 inch wheel as well. I use this method for the bulk of the removal and then I'll move on to a 1 inch scalloped J-Flex belt so that I can get some rounding going on on the slack belt section. This smooths over the lines and it gives it a very nice feel in the hand. So that slack belt is a 220 grit belt, so I start with a 320 grit paper. I move up to a 600 grit paper and then finally to a 1000 grit paper on this specific knife. It was around this time that I start noticing a small crack towards the lanyard tube on this knife. And it was a fairly devastating moment uh, once I came to terms with this knife being uh, subpar. So you can see here that I'm sharpening that section and then it's just all hits you at once that this whole knife is pretty much a goner. Now I'll still be sending this knife to Jason at Diomedes as a prototype now uh, just so he can get a feel for it in his hands but I would not recommend batoning with this knife in this condition. Unfortunately this is a result of a mistake that I made early in the process by drilling the hole for my lanyard tube way too close to the edge. This is actually the first lanyard tube that I've ever put on a knife, and this is a painful lesson that I will never forget. By drilling it so close to the edge, the amount of wood around the outside of that lanyard tube is very minimum, and that is why it cracked. So I decided to finish this knife anyway. I got it up to a 1000 grit finish. I cleaned up the spine on the scotch Brite belt so that all of my scratches are going in the same direction. I then sharpened it on my Win uh, water-cooled sharpening system to around a 19 degree angle. And then I stropped the edge, came out super sharp. I was, everything else about this knife I was extremely happy about. It was a great looking knife, uh, it felt great in the hand, it had good proportions, you know, so uh, props to Jason for his design. And it was probably, you know, like I said, the prettiest knife that uh, we were not able to sell. <laughs> So this is how it turned out. Now you know my plunge lines on this one were very symmetrical. By using that 45 degree jig, it really kept my edge in the center of the knife. And then the coke bottling on this one's probably the best I've ever done. So other than that failure at the lanyard tube, I'm very happy with how this knife came out. I mean, just look at those liners. That is class right there. That's a classy knife. Anyway, so I will be sending this knife, like I said to Jason anyway, as a prototype so that he can look it over and then maybe think through some sheath designs for future knives that we make together. As always guys, if y'all like this video or you got something out of it, please make sure to hit that like button down below. If you had problems with lanyard tubes in the past or you have some suggestions for my next build, please hit me up in the comments. I make sure to answer every comment that gets put onto my videos. Also, please consider subscribing to the channel. That will really help us out, and it will put this type of content in your feed on YouTube when you log on. Until the next time, I'll catch y'all on the flip side.